Grace can move mountains of guilt and shame. Grace can flood your days in the desert with streams of living water. Grace can bring you through the fire of adversity without the smell of smoke being upon you. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can only receive it because God is so glad to give it. Grace is an ocean without a shoreline. Grace has no limit. God's grace will give you a new beginning. God's grace is greater than your sin. God's grace is greater than all your faults and failures. And it's the only thing that can truly heal you. How many of us believers live depressed and discouraged because they feel that they can never measure up? This is what's happening in the church. People who's put their faith in Jesus. This is what's happening every day. And that's because we don't understand the grace of God. Because somehow you feel like it's still your works that is making you accepted by God. You are in a place right now believing the lie that the enemy wants you to believe that somehow after you receive God's grace, now you have to work to keep it. Grace is the unmerited, undeserved, unearned kindness and favor of God. That's what grace is. It's unmerited, it's undeserved, and it's unearned. Like there's nothing you did. What you do does not allow God to put his grace on display for you. God's grace comes to even those that have not been faithful. God's grace is, comes to even those that have really not walked the way that they should walk. And yet his grace and his mercy is extended to every single person that will believe him, that will come, that will humble themselves under his mighty hand. Because in our minds, we have delineations of like, who's bad? And this is maybe one of the fundamental problems that we have in the Christian faith and in the world today is because the levels to our sin and the levels to our faith and the levels to our outward devotion, we categorize people on levels of how close they are to God and how far they are from God. Because somehow we become the measuring stick of God's goodness. Somehow... God has chosen me to now, come on, let's be honest. This is not what we say, but this is what we do. Somehow he's chosen me to be the, the, the temperature or the gauge for, for how all other human beings are viewed by God. Like that was me for so many years is that I would never say it, but I always thought I'm better than you. Because it was ingrained in me somehow that because of the family I was raised in, the church I went to, the, the, the people who knew me, my prayers, because I could pray. And I gave a little bit and I was faithful and I messed up. But who does it? All of sin falling short of the glory of God, but I don't fall as much as you. Come on, let's. I'm going to write a book that said what you really meant by the scripture. I'm going to write a, it would be a best, because that's what we really mean. Like it works for me, but it doesn't really apply to you. And the reason why you don't know what to say or do right now is because somewhere deep down in us feel like what people do is really who they are. And if they did it, then somehow, and you didn't, then somehow you're better than them. If you're the suburban mom who has a nine bedroom house and goes on vacation twice a year and you're a homeless person living and eating out of the trash can, you both are still in need of the same grace that is provided only by Jesus Christ. But why is grace amazing? Like, not enough just to have grace, but explain to me amazing grace. 
And as I looked into it, I looked at that word amazing. And that word amazing is talking about things that are unusual. Doesn't make sense. And I began to think about it. And God said, when it's amazing, it's not average. When it's amazing, it's something that the average person can't do. Or maybe let's take it a step further when we talk about God. It's, it's something that they wouldn't do. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through one action, faith. So like when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have now been extended grace only through your ability to receive it through faith. Okay? And that not of yourselves. And I love that because it tells you, because you would try to take credit for it. And, and it keeps coming back to the same thing. It's not of your works. It's not because you gave that large offering. It's not because you served the orphans in Haiti. It's the free gift of God. He says, but it is the undeserved gracious gift, verse 9, not as a result of your works, nor your attempts to keep the law, so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for his salvation. Saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do, look what we do, trust him. We trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play a major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No, we neither make or save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? And, and what happens is I know this sucks because it doesn't make you better than nobody. Like, and this is the hard thing where religion comes in and, and, and tries to make the differences. No, well, we believe in this and then you believe in that and, and then we do this, but you only do it on this day. And, and we're tr so everybody's trying to be the one who's God's favorite. And what God's looking at all of us and saying, you're all my favorites. As a matter of fact, y'all hold on, because I'll leave the 99. Oh, y'all didn't, y'all didn't come. I'll leave. I know y'all good, but my child. That's when we'll understand, do we really understand grace? Are we still feeling somewhere it's about our works? And I, as I began to study this, I was trying to think of examples of where this applied in my life. And I probably have one of the best fathers in the world. I don't just have a good father. I have a grace filled father. I remember one specifically that happened almost every week when me and my brothers were in middle school and high school. I have four brothers and inevitably one of us would forget or use prematurely our lunch money every day. And, and what ended up happening was we call our dad and like clockwork every day one of my brothers he would come and give us new lunch money and and this is the thing that i i always remember he never punished us or and he never asked why we kept doing it it was almost as if as a father he expected that his children would mess up and he already was always prepared to take care of all of our stupid mistakes. And when I begin to think about what grace is, it's our heavenly father already taking in consideration all your stupid mistakes and said, I'm going to send a payment that will be able to take care of all of your mistakes. And when I saw that, I said, man, that's what grace like a flood looks like. Where many of us, if we were doing that and our kids were doing that, you ain't eating today. <laughs> Come on, let's be honest. Because we're always in a place where we feel like we got to teach you that what you did, you suffer for. But once you receive the grace of God, you get to experience another level of God's faithfulness.
God doesn't throw you away. He says, let me into that. Can, can I help you with that? And I can restore what looks broken to the world. And I can make it something that other people can learn from. But you got to like let grace like a flood come into that situation. And this is the sad thing about us. Many of us don't want it for other people because we haven't accepted it for ourselves. I'm going to say that one more time. Many of us do not want grace like a flood to be poured out for other people because we have not truly accepted it for ourselves. God is not holding you hostage to what you did when you were in college. You're holding yourself hostage. And he keeps saying, can we move past this? I already paid for it. He paid our bill in full. And my last point is grace is unearned. And this is the one that a lot of people get messed up on. But Romans eleven six 6 says, and if by grace, then it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it's of works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Let me help you understand this. Let's substitute for grace and works free and earned. If it's free, it's not earned. Otherwise, free is not free. If it's earned, it's not free. Otherwise, earned is not earned. This scripture is saying either grace is one of two things. It's free or it's earned. And many of us don't want to accept that the grace of God is a free gift. Like, like it's unearned. Look what the Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible says about it. It says grace is the dimension of divine activity that enables God to confront human indifference and rebellion with an inexhaustible capacity to forgive and to bless. Like you, you can't run out of forgiveness for us. You, you won't stop blessing us. It's free. Which the scripture says over and over, it's the free gift of God. It's the free gift of God. What can you do with the gift? What's the only thing you can do? Receive it. And, it, and grace has a name. Jesus. Jesus. 